Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in the Trick Game Theatre Com video, we're going to be discussing tech news, which, as usual, has popped up over the past 24 or so hours. We're going to be starting things out with Intel, because further benchmarks of the Coffee Lake series of processors has appeared on the internet, and they are looking to be very impressive indeed. Then we're going to move over to Team Green with NVIDIA, because the GTX 1040 mobile graphics card has been spotted, and then we're going to be discussing all things Vega, specifically, and most focused upon pricing of these graphics cards because some retailers are telling us that they are buying the Vega based GPUs at a very high markup indeed and nowhere near the price that you would expect them to be uh, purchasing these cards to then sell to us with a decent margin. So we'll start things out as I just said with Intel and a user by the name of Kuton that is C-U-T-T-O-N has posted on a Chinese website Probably going to butcher the name, unfortunately, but it is Zihu. I think that's Z H I H U, and has placed a lot of information regarding the benchmarks of the 8700K. We've got some stuff on the 80, uh, 8400. I was about to say the 8500. We've also got some stuff on the 8400. We'll share in a moment. But we'll start, as I said, with the 8700K. Now this is an ES, standing of course for engineering sample, so performance might slightly deviate, but it looks like, at least according to the CPU Z image, assuming this is not fake, obviously I don't know this for certain, but it looks fairly genuine, at least in terms of performance. Quick reminder, it is of course 6 cores, 12 threads. And what is the too long didn't read? Well, the too long didn't read, my friends, is that as suspected, it basically negates any point of the 7800X, and one can make a very compelling argument that even the 7820X is probably not even somewhat worth your time. There are a couple of benchmarks that he's released. Fritz Chessmark, uh, Chess Benchmark, excuse me, that was terrible. W Prime 210. Cinebench R11.5, and finally Cinebench R15, so actually quite a nice assortment. Fritz is not so much used generally here in, you know, the Western world, but it's still used occasionally. So multi-thread, um, well, yeah, pretty obviously it is decimating the 7800X, and also pretty much crushes the 7700K as well. So in terms of multi-thread, you're looking at about 70,500 uh, once again for Fritz versus just a shade under 25,000. Single thread performance is pretty much identical. I suspect the IPC gains, of course, of Coffee Lake are somewhat negated by the somewhat less aggressive clock speeds of the 8700K in general. But here's where things get interesting. If we were to just scooch along down a bit to the uh, Ryzen 7 1700, uh, multi-thread performance of the um, processor in uh, R15 is around 1420. Whereas on the other hand, the 8700K is getting 1410. Now obviously, as we all know, Ryzen 7 is very memory clock speed sensitive as well as timing sensitive and all the other bits and pieces. So these figures can go slightly up and down depending on your setup, but they're within the realms of acceptability. However, the single thread performance to me is probably the most telling. The uh, 8700K is getting about 190 compared to 145. So what this means is, Yes, the Ryzen 7 1700 or its ilk definitely do better when heavy multi-threading is involved, but I suspect for many gamers, you might be slightly better off with the 8700K. In fact, even if you're, I wouldn't say like a professional streamer, but let's say you do a bit of streaming on the side, say Twitch or whatever, or you perhaps just want to do a bit of work in the background while you're playing some games, perhaps the 8700K may be better for you. Now, obviously, Ryzen 7 has had multiple uh, improvements with games. We've seen that Ashes of Singularity, Rise of the Tomb Raider, and so on. And that has drastically improved the performance of Ryzen and Ryzen 7 in those games. And that's a good thing. But still, for those games which really need the high performance in a single thread, well, you can quite clearly see the difference. For those who do not need hyper-threading, you might be saying, well, what about the 6-core derivatives with non-hyper-threading, and others 8400K or 85? Well, what we have here is some Sysoft Sandra stuff of the 8400K. Basic synopsis, you're looking at, obviously, depending on the application or the task, anything from 14 to around 40 or even 50% increase with Sysoft Sandra. For example, 
Process arithmetic compared to the older generation i5s is about a 40% increase. Multimedia, you're looking at around 50% increase. Aggregate data is around 28-29%. So essentially this processor is obviously much faster than its older uh, cousins, primarily because it's got a couple of additional cores. So providing that those cores are heavily optimized and optimized for multi-core, you're definitely going to get a larger performance jump over the older generation. Of course, if you're playing uh, or using games which are only single thread performance or don't really require too much uh, work from additional cores, that type of uh, task, then yeah, Coffee Lake is not too much of a big jump. Honestly, I don't. I, I'm in two minds about Coffee Lake right now because I'm happy it's like this, but to be honest, Coffee Lake, in my opinion, is what KB Lake should have been. So, I. I, I Rather than saying that, you know, it's an amazing achievement from Intel, I just feel that this is the processor they should have brought into the into the mix rather than Kaby Lake. Kaby Lake just should not have been, it should not have existed, and instead we should have really just seen Coffee Lake from the beginning. But that, of course, is just my opinion. Next up, very small piece of news from Team Green. We are always... Uh, on the lookout for mobile parts, aren't we? Well, okay, maybe not the most exciting, I grant you. But still, for individuals who are thinking of buying a laptop or mobile device, good news, I guess. The GTX 1040 is starting to appear on the internet, as in rumours. We already have the IdeaPad 320S, and supposedly it's going to be the first laptop with it. Information on the specifications are somewhat thin on the ground, but Lenovo's new laptop overall is going to sell for about 760 euros. That comes with an i5 8250U, 8 gigabytes of RAM, a 256 gigabyte SSD, and of course the topic, which is the NVIDIA GeForce G, uh, 1040. Honestly, I I'm always really kind of dicey about recommending these type of graphics cards for even light gaming because typically and obviously might be wrong but typically when you're in this kind of price realm i best basically the difference in price between like a 1040 and maybe a 1050 kind of equipped laptop may not be that big of a deal obviously we're gonna have to wait for battery tests and that type of thing to see if it's worth it because maybe if gaming isn't really your thing but in which case I would suggest just having like a basic integrated graf uh, graphics card anyway. Unless perhaps you need something like this for, I don't know, 3D acceleration or perhaps CUDA acceleration of like Adobe Premiere and stuff like that. Even so, let's face it, this type of laptop with 256 gigabytes SSD, not ideal for that type of work anyway. Um, well, I guess we're going to talk about Vega again. And the pricing subject is just... Absolutely ridiculous at this point. So, we all know that one of the big problems with Vega is HBM2. And I could do an entire video on this topic alone. Um, because I've got a lot to say, to be honest, when it comes to HBM2 and the choice for Vega. But, too long didn't read. We've got it now. Not too much to be done about it. However, it is considerably more expensive than GDDR5. Obviously, we don't have an exact estimate because AMD are not saying, hey, well, this it's costing us this much. But, you know, most people would say it's at least about two and a half to three and a half times more expensive than the equivalent GDDR5. Admittedly, GDDR5 and GDDR5X have gone up a little in price, and that's putting it mildly. So there is that to take into consideration. But basically, AMD bet that HBM2 would be cheaper by now than what it really is. So... Many are saying, and I don't know this for certainty because obviously I'm not at AMD and I'm not peeking into their shipping manifests and financial records, but many are suspecting that the margins for Vega are not exactly ideal. And this is not helped by, of course, the fact that the cards are very difficult to produce. Specifically by the cards, I mean the actual, well, the GPU, the actual chips. That combined with the shortages of HBM2 memory, and you get the idea, it's essentially causing the cards to be fairly difficult to, to produce. Uh, limited quantities are available, and it's just not ideal for anyone. So, um, accordingly, a website by the name of Tech Power Up have put out an article, and they are telling us that retailers may not be the ones who are quick to make a buck. And this does actually 
fairly well match up with stuff that OC UK and a couple of other retailers have said as well. There are a couple of leaked invoices which are doing the rounds. They've managed to get one of these. Uh, these are basically supply inventory, uh, supply invoices, uh, which would be sent to retailers. So obviously retailers just don't get these things magically appearing. Much like if you were to buy something from, say, Amazon, you get, you know, that nice slip to say, hey, this is how much you spent. This is the item you've got so on. This is obviously for tax purposes and just so you've got, well, you know, a record of your purchases. Much the same, of course, is for retailers. And apparently even they are indeed fa uh, facing inflated prices. Now, there's a website, uh, sorry, a retailer by the name of Mar Laboratories. It might be MA Laboratories, but I'm going to say it's Mar Laboratories. And they are quoting 675 US dollars for a reference design. I just want to stress that reference design, RX vega 64 now bear in mind this is the not limited edition version this is not a water-cooled version this is not the version that's going to make you coffee in the morning and you know give you a foot massage this is just a standard basic card now this is pretty much stating the obvious but let's say you're a retailer and you are being quoted 675 dollars per unit and you do what? I mean, you can't sell that for $500, right? Which is, of course, the launch price. No, you can't do that because, let's just face it, you would essentially be losing money per card sold. And from what we understand, um, once again, from other websites and people who are kind of asking around in the industry, basically, AMD, for the first X number of cards which are sold, they basically gave a subsidy. So, let's say, for example, they were to sell the card, you were to sell the card uh, as a retailer, AMD would essentially pay you back a portion, and a website by the name of Overclock3D was saying this very fact, and uh, this was happening in UK-based retailers. So, it, it's absolutely just crazy what's going on right now with the Vega launch, and honestly, I'm not quite sure when we're going to see this question answered. As I just mentioned a day or two ago, Apparently, the shortages are going to last for at least a couple of more months for this particular GPU, which is really bad because obviously, if you're a gamer and you've been holding out for and holding out and holding out, you're just going to get to the point now where you just want to buy something. And whether you're going to go with Threadripper, whether you're going to go with Coffee Lake, whether you're going to go with Ryzen, whatever your CPU, maybe you're pretty happy. Let's say, for the sake of argument, you've got like a 6700K that's fairly well overclocked, and all you do is gaming. One can make a very compelling argument. You don't need much more for a couple of years. So, what's the last thing you need? You need, of course, a graphics card. And the problem is, and I've mentioned this in a couple of times before, if you buy into a graphics card ecosystem, you buy an AMD monitor, by which I mean, of course, FreeSync, you're basically tied into that ecosystem unless you want to plonk down loads of more money for then a G-Sync monitor, or you're just like, okay, you know what, I don't actually really need FreeSync to work. Same thing with NVIDIA. So if a lot of people are suddenly just saying, screw it, I just can't be bothered to wait anymore for a Vega card, I'm just going to go and buy a GTX 1080 or whatever you're going to purchase, and I'm going to buy that with like a 1440p G-Sync monitor, that essentially ties you in to NVIDIA's ecosystem, so I'm curious to see how all of this is going to play out. Anyway, um, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye for now.